the white liberal is the actual out of the closet bigot. The white liberal is the direct descendant mentally and world point of view as it relates to race, the direct descendant of slave owners and bigots. Fox Sports, ESPN, um, he played Division I uh, football, which is intimidating, and I'm glad he's on Skype. <laughs> um, and uh, he recently got suspended from Twitter for uh, criticizing the Black Lives Matter founder. Oh, this one, Patrice Kahn. Oh, Patrice Kahn oh, Colors. There's so many founders, it's hard to keep uh, yeah, She bought that huge track. mansion. Yeah, she bought yeah. the $1.4 million mansion. That's all. Uh, but I think he's back on right now um, on, on, on Twitter. Jason, uh, Jason Whitlock, are you there, sir? I am there. Can you hear me? I can hear you, and look at that. That's Perfect. a wonderful. I'm, I'm glad to have you on. I'm sorry that we ran late. When we start talking about uh, you know puberty blockers for children, I get a little I get a little riled up. I don't blame you. Uh, I, I don't get it as a former athlete, uh, I, and I don't get why women aren't more outraged about this, and just parents and mothers. Uh, you know, it's an unfair competition. I don't. Even, how many kids are we even talking about, too, as it relates to do do we? How many kids are transgender or want to change sex? I, well, now I, they're. I, it used to be 0. 0.6, and now there's. It's over two percent in schools, so it, it skyrocketed. There were actually more transgen kids who identified as transgender than have ever identified as lesbian, and so that brings in the nature or nurture argument. Um, where it's like, well, why would there be this skyrocketing number of them? And uh, we don't have a lot of them competing in women's sports now in the past, but it looks like, you know, every women's record probably be gone pretty soon. I agree with the solution of just a transgender league. Yeah. And they can compete amongst themselves. And a steroid league. Because if you have someone, you know, who's transgender on testosterone, then anyone there should be able to take whatever they want and just let the games begin. I mean, you let me ask you this. You played, obviously, Division One ball, and that's a, t that's a contact sport. We just showed some uh, clips of a, of a male identifying as a woman playing handball and just face palming kids. When you were playing football, there were some people, I'm sure, there were open secrets who had used performance-enhancing drugs, right? Yes. And you could se could you sense that difference? I know when I've just done even local grappling tournaments, and there's someone who you've been up against, and then six months later, you go, "This is not the same person." It was drastic. It, it was. I had a weird take on that because I certainly and I played in the '80s. I'm old, <laughs> but because I had a, I was strong and the strongest guy on our team. Yeah. Uh, and so I really didn't care what the other guys did because it was a non-issue for me. Strength was not something I struggled with. Uh, you know, eating was something I struggled with, but not strength. <laughs> and But it was funny. The coaches actually favored the steroid users over someone like me. I, I was a bit of a locker room lawyer, and I can remember a very good friend of mine uh, I would, the bench press was the big deal. And, it, you know, whoever could bench the most was a big deal. Your picture was up in the locker room in a prominent place. Yeah. And the coaches hated me so much that they let someone else retest months later after he did a steroid cycle and he <laughs> broke my record and they put his picture up immediately. I didn't care. The guy was a friend of mine. You know, we played different positions, but Wow. Uh, yeah, there's... Jason, are you back on Twitter? I know you were suspended. Are you allowed back now? Yeah, they suspended me on Friday, and then they let me back in on Tuesday. Uh, they said that I reached out to them. I did not reach out to them. I just think they got beaten up so bad by people raising the question, like, why the hell did you do this to this guy? Uh, that they folded and sent me an apology. And for people who don't know, the tweet in question uh, that resulted in it, from what we know, is you tweeted that uh, the Black Lives Matter founder bought a $1.4 million home in Topanga, which has a black population of 1.4%. And then you add a little sting to it saying, she's with her people, um, which I appreciate. And that got you into trouble? I mean, look, this is something, you've spoken out quite a bit with Black Lives Matter, and I know that you've, yeah. I mean, you've been in media for a long time. Um, what is your how have most people reacted to you in this industry oh people in the sports media lane and just in the media in general are scared to death of black lives matter they're scared to death of 
any type of Twitter Twitter lynch mob coming after them and criticizing them. You don't want to be on the wrong side of this argument because they'll paint you as either racist or a sellout to black people. And so everybody avoids the truth. Everybody knows the Black Lives Matter movement is not about black men. It's not about uh, George Floyd, uh, Rayshard Brooks, Jacob Blake. It's an LGBTQ agenda. Right. Black Lives Matter. The whole black men thing is just a smokescreen. It was founded by three LGBT women. I know uh, it's hard for me to remember the acronyms too. So yeah. we'll, <laughs> I call them the Alphabet Mafia. Yes, the Alphabet and Mafia. The Alphabet Mafia yeah. is in control of social media and Twitter. Uh, Jack Dorsey has stated, I think in the interview with Joe Rogan, he stated Twitter's there to amplify certain voices. Right. And the Alphabet Mafia is a voice that they have amplified. And, you know, I've just been very critical because it's all been a hustle. It's all been about money. It's all been about agendas outside police brutality. Yeah. And it's all been a distortion of the truth because police brutality, and, and, and I say this having lost a close relative, a cousin that I helped raise was killed by police in 2012 in Indianapolis. I actually understand the injustice of police brutality, but it's greatly overblown in yeah. America. There's 50 million, 100 million engagements police have with our citizens and a very tiny percentage of them spin out of control and lead to someone well, dying. You know, people often talk about like white privilege and stuff like that. And, 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 and the issue here is obviously identifying people um, exclusively by their race is a problem. But I will say yeah. something here uh, as a white person. Uh, I do feel a privilege, and I talked with someone about this at the Change My Mind, where I have not, um, as a white man, no one says, you have to fit into this specific box. In other words, when I'm a kid, I can listen to metal, I can listen to hip hop, I can listen to country, and no one says, you're not white enough. You know, whereas I had a black friend who was an Iron Maiden fan, and his friend said like, man, you're not black. And I go, oh, that's not something I really experienced. And you get that in the media too, um, where it's, you don't have the right opinions as black. And what's interesting is the overwhelming majority of black Americans want at least as much or more police presence than they currently have in their communities. And we've been talking about this, and you know, I go to a church that's mixed. Um, I feel, and I know a lot of the black people there, even though they're Christians, they vote Democrat, but I feel a lot more comfortable around black Democrats. We have more in common than the white Democrats right now. It's almost like black Democrats, if you look at the actual representation, in America, as opposed to who's speaking in the media, they're the moderate wing of the Democratic Party. Your views that you're talking about right now are far more representative, statistically, in poll after poll, of the average black American than the talking head on CNN. Why, do they re why is it white people on Twitter removing you for having the wrong black opinion? Because, Stephen, and this is just the truth, and I'm sorry anybody gets offended by it, the white liberal is the actual out of the closet bigot. The white liberal is the direct descendant mentally and world point of view as it relates to race, the direct descendant of slave owners and bigots. Every, they believe that black is a special category of human beings that restricts your freedom. Right. And that's what they believed in 1600s. That's what these white liberals believe now. And that's why they want to capitalize the B in black, because we're a special category of human beings. Yeah. And so we want to designate them over here and they can only think one way. And just as, as you said, we're the only people that have no political freedom uh, because if, if we uh, and again, I'm a non voter and I. I tend to abhor politics and politicians on both sides. I have in recent years just like discovered like, man, this white liberal thing, this is some pure racism. <laughs> I just yes. don't see that pure racism on the other side. Uh, but, but as black people, again, if you think any conservative thought, if you stay true to what you were taught in the church, oh my God, you've sold black people out. Right. And I just refuse to do that. I, I, I would rather uh, have group think and social media think I'm a sellout of my skin color than to think I'm a sellout of Jesus Christ and my Christian beliefs. 
I'm, I'm going to stand on Careful. That. Jesus Christ, now you're getting into Western civilization and uh, patriarchy. We have to be careful. We need a female deity. I'm no. a patriarch. <laughs> yeah, you are a patriarch. That's also one thing, too, I will say. It's, it's this unholy alliance, because when you look at, like, liberals and they talk about the patriarchy, I go, do you understand that in the black community, like, gender roles are way more clearly defined? Like, they don't have a problem with this idea of masculinity, either. They just, they just want black people's votes Word. for liberals. Yeah. Were. Yeah. You got to use the word were because oh. they're blurring those lines and they've been very effective. This little mind control thing they do, like, if you you know, the, the number one thing you can do as a black person is hate Donald Trump. That's how you prove that you're black. And we got to snap out of that. Yeah. The number one thing you can do as a black person is be responsible for yourself and be responsible for whatever you create right. on this planet and that that's how but but they just you know you got to hate donald trump you got to think all white people and republicans are your enemy and none of it is about the man in the mirror it's always about someone outside who's in control of your life and it just it drives me crazy i sit and laugh and i'm listening to you talk about the church you go to and being mixed race and it confirms a thought that I had about you just following you and your show and the controversy from afar. The reason why you're so daring is because in your actual life, you don't live a racist life. And so it makes you more fearless in your public job on this show. Whereas the people that are doing all the social mimic gimmicks and virtue signaling, if you go examine their real life, it's it's not as diverse. It's not as inclusive. No, as your as your life. No, not at all. Here's the thing: the left believes that uh, race identifies every facet of human being and needs to be the defining factor, uh, but is off limits for jokes. And I'm the exact opposite. I'm like race doesn't mean all that much, but it's fun for for jokes. That's why we have my half Asian lawyer. We have a half Asian. I mean, we we have a pretty diverse group of people here. Um, matter of fact, probably the most racist person here is a Colombian, but it's only against Argentinians. <laughs> he hates them. <laughs> He hates Argentinians. The tribalism from South Americans. Don't get him started on Argentinians. Yeah, it's uh, to me, we just did a change my mind uh, that'll be coming out uh, Monday or Tuesday on, oppo to me, opposing voter ID is racist. And this is something people say, well, what do you mean? I said, look, I have not heard an argument in opposition to voter ID because they have all said voter ID is racist. It disenfranchises minorities. Those are the, that's the premise. And I said, and I was speaking with a black student, I said, I've never heard an argument that strikes me as anything other than deeply racist. He said, what do you mean? I said, the idea that black people can't get an ID. He said, well, a lot of them don't have ID. I said, well, statistically, that's not true. It's anywhere from 86 to 90% of the population. But why do you think they can't get an ID? So, well, because some of them don't live uh, near a DMV. I said, well, statistically, they live in urban areas. Statistically, if you're going to talk about disenfranchising voters, it would be the white rural farmer because they might have to drive an hour and a half. I said, so you don't think black people can, they live near, can they use a bus? Can they drive? A lot of black people don't drive. I said, okay, can they fill it out online? A lot of black people don't know how to use the internet. I said, see, this is what I'm saying. That sounds kind of racist. No, it's not kind of. It's racist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. It's racist. That's exactly. And it's not. One of the things conservative people say is they call it soft bigotry. And I'm totally against, you got to eliminate the word soft. It's yeah. just bigotry. The, the bigotry of low expectations. It's not the bigotry of, or it's not the soft bigotry of low expectations. It is the bigotry of low expectations. And they hit us with that all the time. And the number one reason why I'm against that is because I've succeeded in corporate America Despite, I probably graduated high school with a 2.8 grade point average. I was kind of a class clown. In college, I was drunk, high, playing football. Uh, you were basically a method school. man who was uh, hitting yeah. people on the field. Yeah. yeah. Didn't take school very soon. Graduated with a 2.3. I'm not special. I moved into the corporate world, and mostly I just show up and I do what I'm asked to do. And then, you know, I tend to the writing stuff I do it now at a high level. But again, it's not I'm not special. And so all you have to do is try. Right. And we're the left is trying to convince. But don't try. You have no chance. This whole world is against you. You have no shot. Ignore Jason Whitlock's 300 pound ass who got a <laughs> national television show on Fox Sports and 
uh, got to do ESPN and got to earn a shit ton of money. Ignore him. You know, I don't fit the profile of a TV star, but I was paid like one. So you can't tell me that we can't accomplish these things and that, you know, America. So and and, and uh, Stephen, in 1984, my senior year in high school, me and my dad were dirt poor. We lived in a one bedroom, 400 square foot apartment in the ghetto. So nobody can convince me and trust 2.8 grade point average. I was a pretty good football player, but no one can convince me that there's these uh, barriers that we can't overcome as poor black people if we just try. And I'm so irate with the people who are saying, don't even try. You have yeah. no shot. You don't, know, don't give it an you effort. can't do anything without us. Or the government. Though I will try and convince you because I think you may still be eligible to play women's college football. If you get social media backlash, the executives, the white executives, they get scared. Oh my God, you know, I don't I don't want my employees seen as being anti black or sellouts or racist. And yeah. so so many executives are controlled by social media that I don't blame a lot of black media people for living in fear of social media. And yes, I think many of them agree with a lot of things that I say. Uh, they don't feel like they're free to say them without facing severe repercussions. Uh, and so they don't, you gotta remember, I'm, I'm single with no kids. And so I get to be a bit more fearless than some 45 year old guy that's got a wife and two kids. Right. And, he gets on the wrong side of Twitter, loses his job. His wife's pretty angry with him, and he probably never gets laid again. <laughs> You're describing my life, sweetheart. Uh, hey. Well, thanks for taking that risk for all of them. Yeah, right? you're in a position to right. do it. You did it. You could have just said, you know, you could have just said pat and not done it. So thank you. For it's that. a little less of a risk when you're a 300 pound black man. You know, they'll only tweet at you. It's <laughs> it's the Geraldo Rivera, Dan Bongino. You son of a bitch. You punk. It's like, oh, man, I know where you live. Oh, oh no. I thought you were. Uh, I don't know. But I'm old. Yeah, I'm old. I'm blind. Oh, I compete in women's divisions. All right. Hey, uh, Jason, we're going to go to uh, Mug Club here. Uh, but where's the be while we're still on YouTube, where's the best place for people to support you? Well, uh, at Whitlock Jason on Twitter for right now. And. Very soon, I'm going to announce what I'm going to be doing next, uh, and I'll just have to ask people to stay tuned for that. Okay. All right. And we're going to stand in line with Jason Whitlock here, so uh, we go to Mug Club where he can say what he really thinks. My guess is if he wants to stomp some crackers. Uh, YouTube, thank you so much. Piss off. Watch Louder with Crowder live, Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. Eastern.